You're listening to the European Parliamentary Research Service podcast on the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with Canada. Few acronyms have raised as much debate among the public and in political spheres as CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between the EU and Canada. Despite negotiations having concluded in September 2014, few could have predicted the trouble awaiting its approval. Stay with us and we'll walk you through the main points of this controversial trade agreement. Canada and the EU are good trading partners. Proof of this is that in 2015, European and Canadian companies exchanged goods for a total amount of 64 billion euros, making Canada the EU's 11th most important trade partner. In turn, the EU is Canada's second most important trade partner after the USA. So what do we sell to each other? Well, the EU is mainly interested in Canadian machinery, precious metals and mineral products, while Canada looks for European transport equipment and chemicals. And it's not only about goods, trade and services, mostly transport, insurance and communication services, amounted to nearly 28 billion euros in 2014. But there is untapped potential that both sides are eager to explore. So negotiations on a comprehensive economic and trade agreement between the EU and Canada started in May 2009 and concluded in September 2014. The overall aim is to increase flows of goods, services and investment to the benefit of both sides. For EU companies operating on Canadian markets, it would mean overcoming the current disadvantage vis-à-vis US competitors, which benefit from the North American Free Trade Agreement. For Canada, CETA would be the most important agreement in terms of trade and investment volume since NAFTA and would help reduce its dependency on the US business cycle. In 2008, a joint study by the Commission and the Canadian government on the potential impacts of a new trade deal estimated EU exports to Canada would increase by nearly 25%, which means an extra 17 billion euros for EU companies. Canadian exports would increase by 20%, generating an extra 8.8 billion euros for Canadian businesses. But in the end, everyone stands to win. Or at least this was the conclusion of a study carried out for the European Commission in 2011, which expected CETA to lead to overall gains in welfare, total exports, real GDP and wages in both Canada and the EU. So how has such an important agreement been negotiated? Let's go back to 2009. In April 2009, the Council authorised the Commission to open negotiations with Canada on a new comprehensive trade agreement. But this was before the Lisbon Treaty came into force. So what changed then? Essentially, two main things. The first one is that by including foreign direct investment in the EU's exclusive competences, it was possible to add investment and investment protection to the range of subjects in the negotiations. Secondly, by extending the Parliament's powers vis-à-vis the EU's common commercial policy, it gave MEPs a privileged seat to observe and monitor the negotiations with Canada. But what is CETA about? In a nutshell, CETA liberalises trade in goods and services, except in specific cases where reservations have been made. It deals with topics such as rules of origin to determine the country of origin of a specific product, sanitary and phytosanitary rules, technical barriers to trade, customs and trade facilitation, intellectual property rights, regulatory cooperation, sustainable development and government procurement. So what changes will it bring once it comes into force? To begin with, CETA will eliminate practically all duties on industrial goods, saving European exporters almost 600 million euros a year and creating new market opportunities in sectors such as financial services, telecommunications, energy and maritime transport. For certain agricultural products, liberalisation will happen over time. CETA will also open up the Canadian services market to European firms, offering them more opportunities to provide services, for example, specialised environmental services where European firms have a strong position. With CETA, European businesses will also have a better chance to bid for Canadian public contracts, a market worth over €30 billion a year. To protect public services, the EU introduced additional reservations for specific public services such as health, social and education services and postal services. CETA is also expected to create new opportunities for farmers and food producers while protecting Europe's so-called geographical indications. In total, a list of 173 products, including cheeses, wines and spirits, with a long special history in the EU. Besides, all imports from Canada will have to satisfy EU rules and regulations, which means, for example, that only hormone-free meat will be imported into the EU. 
CETA also integrates the EU's and Canada's obligations under international rules on workers' rights and environmental and climate protection. And by guaranteeing the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, it will make it easier for professionals to work on the other side of the Atlantic. To boost investment, the agreement also ensures that domestic and foreign investors are treated in the same way and according to the principle of non-discrimination. In general terms, CETA seeks to ensure protection for investments while safeguarding the right of governments to regulate in the public interest, including when such regulations affect a foreign investment. To do this, the new investment court system has replaced a traditional investor state dispute settlement that still exists in many trade deals negotiated by individual EU countries in the past. The new court will move decisively away from the traditional approach and establishes independent and impartial investment tribunals inspired by the principles of public judicial systems. It will also include an appeal mechanism. However, public opinion concerns, and notably the objections of the Walloon regional government in Belgium, forced parties into some late-night negotiations to save the deal. In the end, a solution was found. Furthermore, Belgium will ask the European Court of Justice to assess whether the proposed investment court system is compatible with EU law. So, now that we know what the deal is about, let's hear what the different actors have to say about it. Well, if you've been reading the press, you'll know CETA has given rise to a lively public and political debate in a number of member states. And while some criticisms are directed specifically at CETA, others seem more targeted at the transatlantic trade and investment partnership being negotiated with the US, or echo more general anti-globalisation and anti-free trade positions. Many worry that CETA could be used by US companies to get into the European market through the back door via their Canadian subsidiaries, so they reject current plans for trade investment bridges with transatlantic partners. Others, like the chair of the International Trade Committee in the European Parliament, believe what unites us is greater than what divides us and warn against the dangers of mixing up criticisms. But what are actually the main criticisms of CETA? Well, the truth is that similar concerns have been voiced on both sides of the Atlantic, but Europeans are mainly worried about a few things such as regulatory cooperation. What does this mean? It means they're afraid that the future harmonisation and mutual recognition of rules could result in the lowering of European standards in consumer, health and environmental protection. The Commission, however, argues that CETA will not affect EU rules on food safety or the environment, nor restrict the power of regulators in member states or at EU level. Besides, we should also not forget that Canada often follows the precautionary principle when making laws. Other concerns, especially from trade unions, are the potential lowering of labour and social standards and a supposed lack of transparency and democratic control during the negotiations, criticising the low involvement of civil society groups as well as the national and European parliaments. Still, the European Commission has been keeping both the public and the European Parliament much more informed about ongoing trade negotiations than in the past and is currently discussing a more citizen-friendly formula for negotiating trade deals. Another target of continued criticism is the new investment court system, as opponents fear it will open the door for foreign companies to challenge European state regulations seeking multi-million dollar court settlements on the grounds that they limit their profits, restricting European government's ability to protect the environment workers' rights and healthcare. Critics also fear that the reservations covering specific public services such as health, social and educational services won't effectively shelter public services from liberalisation pressures. The Council, Canada and Member States have reacted to the heavy criticism and the Walloon Parliament's objections by offering additional assurances concerning the right to regulate public services, labour rights, consumer and environmental protection and the impartiality of judges sitting on investment tribunals. Thanks to this, CETA was signed by Canada and the EU on the 30th of October 2016. So what's next now? Well, first of all, the European Parliament must give its consent for CETA to enter into force provisionally. And because it's treated as a so-called mixed agreement, all national parliaments, as well as up to a dozen regional parliaments in Europe, also need to rubber stamp it. As this could take years... Parts of the agreement could already enter provisionally into force once the Parliament has given it the thumbs up. However, considering the heated debates about the investment court system, EU member states and the Commission agreed that the new investment court system will not be part of the provisional application. In the meantime, the Commission and Canada will fine-tune the parameters of the new system, like the selection of judges, access by smaller businesses to the new system and the appeal mechanism. The ball is now in the European Parliament's court and once MEP 
MPs have given their consent, European and Canadian citizens will be able to start reaping the benefits of the New Deal. Whether the expected new jobs and cash flows will materialize remains to be seen. However, the experience of the EU South Korean trade agreement's first five years has been very encouraging. You're listening to the European Parliamentary Research Service podcast. 